Hello fellow science seekers and welcome back to my channel. If you've been following along on my Instagram, you will have noticed that this week is Antibiotic Resistance Awareness Week. And I've been posting about this every day, focusing each day on different details about this particular issue and why it's so important because I think this stuff is really fascinating. Like personally, I think it's the, the part of biology that really captures my interest the most. And it's so cool and it's really important. And I wanna tell you, all about it. So in this video, we'll be exploring something new, which is solutions to antibiotic resistance. So like, where are we gonna go in the future? But before we dive in, make sure to like and subscribe. Thank you very much. And stay tuned until the end because I have a giveaway announcement that I think you're gonna wanna hear about. Hint, it has to do with this. Starting right off at the top, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with the words. So there are three main words that we use when we talk about this stuff, and those are antibiotic, antibacterial, and antimicrobial. And it can be kind of confusing because these words are used somewhat interchangeably, but technically they're each pretty different and each are a step up in the broadness of what they mean. So antibiotic is the most specific word. It refers to compounds that microorganisms produce naturally to kill bacteria. For example, penicillin is the first antibiotic that was ever discovered by Alexander Fleming in the early 1920s because he went on vacation. And when he came back, all of his petri dishes full of bacteria had been contaminated by a fungus. And that fungus was secreting a substance that was killing the bacteria. So penicillin, that substance that was secreted by that fungus, is an antibiotic. It's a subclass of antibacterial substances, which kind of does what it says on the tin, they kill bacteria. The word antibacterial applies to all of the stuff that kills bacteria and consists of other things in addition to antibiotics, things like soaps or disinfecting techniques, uh, anything that's entirely synthetic, so it doesn't originally come from another natural organism. So antibacterial is the larger category within which antibiotics live. Antimicrobial is the largest category. It refers to anything that kills any microorganism, including bacteria, but also things like fungi and parasites. It can refer to things taken internally, natural compounds, synthetic compounds, external substances. So it's the largest category. And antimicrobial resistance is, I think, the most correct, all-encompassing term to use when talking about this issue as a whole, because pretty much any microorganism can become resistant to pretty much any antimicrobial agent. But the official term for this particular Awareness Week is Antibiotic Resistance Awareness Week. And that is arguably what's producing the most serious like health concerns in humans these days. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to be saying antibiotic resistance, but I hope that little sort of like rundown at the beginning clears up any confusion for you when people refer to those things and what they mean separately and all together. So what antibiotic resistance means is that we've noticed this natural compound that other microorganisms use in nature to disrupt or interrupt bacterial function. And we've taken that compound, we've riffed on it, we've tweaked it, we've isolated it, and we've come up with hundreds of different antibiotic drugs that you can take to treat all manner of different bacterial infections. This diversity of drugs is the result of different organisms, like they were originally produced by lots of different microorganisms. They didn't all just come from that one penicillin fungus example, and they can work in a huge variety of ways. Some of the main mechanisms are ones that keep a bacterium from being able to build or maintain its cell wall, ones that mess with the bacterium's ribosome to keep it from producing the proteins it needs for survival, or directly damaging the bacterium's DNA. Antibiotics can use these particular mechanisms to kill bacteria, but leave human cells untouched because all of these things in bacteria are very fundamentally distinct and different from what's happening in humans. So for example, bacteria have a polymer called peptidoglycan in their cell walls, while humans don't. We actually don't even have a cell wall. We just have cell membranes. So antibiotics that attack peptidoglycan or a bacterium's ability to build a cell wall doesn't affect humans because we don't have one. Bacterial ribosomes and chromosomes are also very fundamentally different from human ribosomes and human chromosomes. So that's how antibiotics don't also kill human cells while fighting off a bacterial infection. But bacteria are clever. And I'm anthropomorphizing here, obviously, but they can come up with ways to evade these antibiotic mechanisms. They may already have a gene in their chromosome that can help them evade antibiotic action. 
and that gene in exposure to the antibiotic gets upregulated or turned on, and that gene will help them develop a mechanism to avoid the antibiotic. Or they may have acquired an antibiotic resistant gene via horizontal gene transfer, because bacteria don't just inherit genetic information during replication or reproduction, they can also trade pieces of DNA back and forth to each other even across species. And the trading of genetic material between bacteria is super cool and actually pretty complicated. So I can't include all of that detail here, but I would like to make a whole video on it at some point. So look out for that because we've got more information that we need to get into. This is important context because all of this means that those bacteria that have developed or acquired a gene that helps them block an antibiotics mechanism of action, those bacteria can then pass that on pretty fast to other bacteria, either through replication or horizontal gene transfer. And these genes can make the bacteria do any number of things to help it survive the attack by the antibiotic. So for example, it can make that cell wall impermeable to the drug so the drug can't even get in. It could help them develop a mechanism to transport the drug out of the cell. It can produce a new compound to bind to the drug because the drug is a little bit like a key, let's say, and the target of the drug is the lock. But if you produce a new lock that fits the key before it can get to the original lock, then you've sort of nullified or inactivated that antibiotic from targeting the things it's supposed to target. So those genes that can get upregulated or shared by other bacteria can fight antibiotics in a whole bunch of different ways. So the way that whole strains of bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics is because of a few key actions on our part as humans who consume those drugs. Because antibiotic resistant bacteria may exist in any population, any bacterial population. Like there are a few antibiotic resistant bacteria that have like gotten smart and developed those mechanisms. But the more we use antibiotics on those populations of bacteria, those drugs will only kill the non-resistant bacteria. So then what's left is the smart ones, the ones that are resistant. And those are the ones that then can replicate and continue to propagate the resistant genes so that over time, we're exerting what's called selective pressure to mold a population that is increasingly resistant to the antibiotic we're exposing it to. So overuse of antibiotics has been a huge contributor to this problem. Conditions like the flu or a cold, for example, those are conditions that are caused by a virus. Antibiotics are not gonna do anything for something like that. So if a doctor is prescribing an antibiotic when you don't actually need it, that is a huge reason that is contributing to cultivation of whole populations of bacteria that we can no longer effectively treat with antibiotics that used to work on them. Another huge problem is if you are prescribed a course of antibiotics and you don't finish them, then the ones, the bacteria left at the end will only be the ones that have the capability to survive that antibiotic antibiotic and will then pass that capability on to the next generations of that particular bacterium. So always finish your course of antibiotics. And I want to take a second here to pause and talk about why we care, because I think it's really easy to get caught up in the microscopic details of the thing. And antibiotics are kind of so ubiquitous nowadays that I think we take them for granted. But when antibiotics were very first used as medicine after the whole Fleming fungus bacteria amazing discovery situation, I don't think it's it's possible to stress enough how fundamentally that changed our world. I mean, people died all the time before antibiotics of seemingly small infections, like a cut on your finger while you're cooking could have killed you pre-antibiotics. And there's a reason that so many people like died of consumption or tuberculosis in like the Edgar Allan Poe days. And it's because we didn't have antibiotics. They are truly, in my opinion, one of the most important and world-changing discoveries of the 20th and 21st centuries. But here in the 21st century, we're starting to see that efficacy slide back. Like in parts of the world we are seeing, including in the United States, we're seeing the re-emergence or the emergence rather of drug resistant strains of the bacteria that cause tuberculosis and pneumonia and chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis, like diseases that we may now think of as almost not a big deal because they're, they have been easy to treat or easier to treat, especially than they were. They're now relatively rapidly becoming harder and harder to treat. I mean, we're looking at a future where syphilis or dysentery could kill you again. 
Like we're back at Oregon Trail situation here. I, that's it's I like it's something that really really scares me. So many things that so many people died of unnecessarily it feels like looking back like that's coming back around again holy crap and it's all because of over prescription of antibiotics when they weren't needed or poor public health communication especially about how to take antibiotics properly and why that's so important what we've got here is failure to communicate like in the u.s an estimated 30 to 35 thousand people die of antibiotic resistant infection every year and that number keeps rising in a way that scientists are surprised by. And it's an issue that is especially near and dear to my heart because as some of you may know, my life partner spent many months earlier this year in the hospital being treated for cancer. And because chemotherapy just totally wipes out your immune system, you really commonly get infections and of resulting like fever and things like that from regular things that your body would normally be able to handle no problem, but because you're immunocompromised, you uh, more often than not may be on a course of IV antibiotics in addition to your chemotherapy. That's important for many reasons, including the fact that if you're on a course of antibiotics, I, either IV or not, that may also have an effect on your body's good bacteria or your microbiome, especially your gut microbiome. And all of these good bacteria are absolutely essential to your body's function. And one of the roles they play is making sure that no bad bacteria have the chance to put down roots in, say, your gut. Like all of the good guys are taking up all of the space and the nutrients so the bad guys can't move in and get a foothold. But if you're on antibiotics, especially broad spectrum, especially IV antibiotics that are like hardcore, then that's wiping out all of your good microbes, your, especially your gut microbes, they're out of there. They've been killed too in the process of trying to get rid of the thing that's making you sick. And all of this means is that now there's all of this fresh real estate for something nasty to make its home in there. And one of those assholes is a bacterium called Clostridioides difficile or C. diff. And hospitals and patients and their families live in fear of C. diff because it's an opportunistic pathogen, which means that it will take any opportunity afforded to it to move in. So say a weakened or immunocompromised host, somebody who's been in the hospital for a long time, someone who doesn't have healthy microbiome, and it's extremely contagious. In hospitals, there's a very rigorous protocol that you have to follow if you think a patient has it involving lots of PPE and special hand washing so that it doesn't spread to other patients. And anyway, C. diff infections in patients without healthy immune systems and without healthy gut microbes are at serious risk of death from dehydration and malnutrition because of the seriously yucky symptoms that the bacterium causes through toxins that it secretes into your digestive tract. So for my partner who fit all of these criteria, we were super worried while he was in the hospital about him getting sick with this opportunistic infection because once someone has it, it's hard to treat anyway in a patient who's already fragile, but C. diff is also increasingly becoming antibiotic resistant to multiple antibiotics. And I can't even express to you how difficult it is to feel so powerless in a situation like that. Like you just feel that way anyway, just because of the cancer. And then to think that maybe the person you love most in the world is sick and might die from an infection that wouldn't be that serious if they weren't being treated for cancer in the first place, but also that the only thing we have to treat that may not work because the treatment we have for it isn't working anymore. Like it's maddening, it's truly, truly a horrible feeling. So I just wanted to share a, a personal example of that with you because I think it's easy to think about these issues as like very distant or maybe like far off in the future, but it's, it's a serious and very real problem that kills a lot of people right now, like today, of previously curable issues. And C. diff is just one example of many, 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 but the long and short of all of this is that antibiotic resistance is a growing problem it's growing really fast and it's really scary so let's get to the point of all of this which is what can we do 
As we've discussed, as a patient, do not request or take antibiotics if the problem you have can be treated in any other way or is not a bacterial problem. Again, do not request or take antibiotics for something that's really, say, a virus. If you do have to take antibiotics, then always, always, always finish the course you're given and never ever share with someone else because then you're both going to be getting an inadequate dose and just selecting for resistant bacteria. So that is a big no-no. All of the public and World Health Organization websites also list as step number one, avoiding getting sick in the first place. Like, yes, of course. But as part of like looking into the future of antibiotic resistance, what are some like long-term solutions? Most experts say that it's not just gonna be one thing, it's gonna need to be multiple strategies in tandem, and I totally agree. And there are a couple of options that are really, really promising. One that I think is gonna be the most helpful in the short term is the development of new antibiotics. And you might think, okay, isn't that just like going in the same circle and playing into the same problem? But new antibiotics will help us keep finding new ways of getting rid of dangerous bacteria, like discovering new bacterial vulnerabilities. And hopefully we can then put in place better practices to help stop or at least stall the resistance or the development of resistance in these to these new drugs. And I think it'll be the, the stop gap that helps get us from now to a longer term solution, or it will be a solution in addition to something else. And one of the most promising something else is, is something called phage therapy. Phage is short for bacteriophage, which is a kind of virus that kills bacteria. They're like bacteria's natural predator, and they kill them in this really cool way by binding to a bacterium and injecting the viral DNA into that bacterium. And that viral DNA within the bacterial genome forces the bacterium to replicate the virus because the virus can't do it on its own. And then eventually there are so many viruses inside the bacterium and they're all secreting toxic chemicals that the bacterium bursts through like a bunch of holes that have been created in its cell wall and it dies. And this actually blew my mind. Phage therapy was used as early as 1919 to treat bacterial infections like dysentery, which is like insane. And they present a couple of distinct advantages over antibiotics. One is that they're highly specific, like they, a, a specific phage has a very specific bacterium that it can bind to and inject its DNA to. It's kind of like that lock and key thing. So its specificity means that it doesn't wipe out the rest of your good bacteria or attack your human cells, which is awesome. And perhaps most importantly, phages can kill bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, even those that are resistant to multiple antibiotics. Like phages can still get at them because of their specific mechanism. But the reason phages didn't go into mass use after their original use in like early 1900s is because then we had antibiotics and antibiotics were easier and cheaper. And because we, we didn't pursue the route of phage therapy at the time, we know relatively little about them and they're expensive. They take a long time to develop for a specific bacterial infection. Some patients may not have the luxury of the time it takes to develop a phage therapy for their infection. So there's gonna need to be a lot of work that goes into it. Phage therapy has been pretty like notably used in some really high profile cases that did not respond to absolutely anything else. So it's not available for like wide scale public patient use yet, but a lot of resources are being poured into it now. And I think it looks really promising. I'm fascinated by it. I'm really excited to see where it goes. Along these same lines, there is some work being done in the efficacy of predatory bacteria. So bacteria that hunt the bacteria that are causing the problem. So that could be very cool. Some groups around the world are developing vaccines for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And this is cool because I think a lot of us, including myself, sometimes think of vaccines as just being preventative treatment for viruses like the polio vaccine or the flu vaccine. But you can actually make vaccines against bacteria too. Like hopefully we all got the DTaP vaccine when we were kids and that inoculates us against the bacteria that cause diphtheria and tetanus. The idea behind bacterial vaccines is the same idea behind vaccines for viruses. Vaccines train your body's immune system to recognize that pathogen and activate against it before it makes you sick. So I think uh, back vaccines for antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria could be a really cool way to go. And I think people are doing some really cool work in that area. 
Another potential antibiotic alternative is immune therapy or the administration of different immune factors that can boost your body's existing immune function and help it respond faster and better to an infection. And it's actually been already effectively used in livestock. So in cows against mastitis or an infection of their udders while they're producing milk. But the problem is that it has to be administered at a very specific time, like around the time when the risk of infection may be higher. So like say when a cow has a calf and is nursing. And so that issue makes it a little difficult to use in humans or for certain kinds of infections because we can't, you know, like predict the future when the risk may be higher, but I think there's some potential there in like using your body's own immune system. There's also some very early work being done into treating the bacterial infection with some kind of gene therapy. So the bacteria themselves are being altered to make them sensitive to antibiotics again. So you're changing the bacterial chromosome to try and downregulate or cut out those genes that make it resistant to an antibiotic. And then you're able to treat them with antibiotics. I think that makes a lot of sense, you know, like just go straight to the source of the problem, but that's in very early days. And I think that that is one of the more difficult solutions. Like that's really complex. It's gonna be really hard to do and hard to do without other complications. And lastly, something I'm really interested in is probiotics. So we were talking about your microbiome, those good bacteria. Probiotics are good bacteria that help your body do what it does. And in, under normal circumstances, they're not gonna make you sick. We actually need them to help us digest our food and they play a really complex role in our body's normal function and in our immune system. We're still like untangling all of that and how it interacts, how those good bacteria keep us safe. We're just really starting to unravel a lot of that. There's some really interesting work coming out these days about how probiotics, so good bacteria, and prebiotics, which is the stuff that good bacteria eat, and symbiotics, or a combination of pro and prebiotics, that administration of any of those may be able to be used in addition to other treatments, or in some cases, as treatments by themselves, especially in, in terms of like gut inflammation or gut infection. And the general idea is that you have enough good bacteria still thriving inside you, then the bad guys will have no place to grow and nothing to eat and I'll have to pack it in and head on out. Or there's the idea also that if you have a really robust and healthy and diverse microbiome to begin with, then infection is less likely to occur or be really serious in the first place, especially if we're talking about your gut. So I think there's a lot of really cool potential applications for uh, co-treatments or supplementary treatments in pro and pre and symbiotics. So in conclusion, to wrap this all up, we are facing a very real and very scary and very fast growing problem. There's some really exciting solutions on the horizon, but they're gonna take time and a lot of resources to make it all the way to real applications in real patients. And in the meantime, there's people who need your help. So if you've made it all the way to the end of this video, then congratulations. You can now hear about my giveaway, which is a giveaway of these shirts. I'll show you the back in a cutaway, but um, it's the Anti-Antibiotic Resistance Club, and they're made by uh, an amazing scientist and entrepreneur and, and charitable human, Mighty Microbe on Instagram. This is who I bought it from. And all donations, all proceeds from this shirt go to patients at the LA Children's Hospital who are struggling with antibiotic resistant infections. So if you wanna be involved in that amazing uh, initiative, then I really encourage you to go and donate. You can get in touch with her on Instagram and ask her how you can donate or buy a shirt for you or a loved one. The holidays are coming up, so definitely do that. But if you'd like to enter to win one of these shirts for free, I have three that I'm giving away. So the giveaway terms are that you need to be following both me and Mighty Microbe on Instagram. I'll put our handles up here. You need to be subscribed to me on YouTube and on the post that I will insert here uh, that I've just posted to Instagram. I'd love for you to comment uh, the most interesting part of this that you think, anything you really wanna comment, really. Uh, say whatever you'd like and tag a friend and that will be your official official entrance into the giveaway. In the next uh, three days, I will make sure that everyone gets the chance to enter, etc. And then at the end of the three days, I will pick three people who will have won a shirt and I'll get in touch with you for your like shipping details and the size that you'd like. So I really hope you want to get involved. I would love for you to be involved in this movement. Having personally experienced being in a hospital and 
having someone who I really care about be at serious risk for an antibiotic resistant infection. This is something that's really important to me and I know that it takes a lot of extra effort and time and money on the part of hospitals and healthcare providers to take preventative measures uh, for those patients and to keep those patients safe. So I, I would really love for you to be a part of making that happen and just increasing awareness. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to learn all about this with me. I think it's super, super fascinating. Microbes, as you guys may know, are like my favorite topic ever. It's my area of interest and my area of, of specialty within science and within biology. So I'm really glad that you guys stuck around and hung out to talk about this with me much appreciated. There are lots of other topics in this realm that I would love to cover. So if you have any in particular that you want me to talk about on this channel, then leave them down in the comments below. As always, like, subscribe, share with someone who you think uh, would find this interesting, and I will see you next time. Thanks, bye! Mm -hmm.